And hi, everyone, and thanks for coming today. What we're going to talk about is what does it mean to practice open scholarship throughout the research life cycle? And what does it truly mean to be an open researcher? And how do you do that? And so what I want to start with, and the way I like to start these sessions is with a question. And so what I'd like you to do is in the chat, describe what word do you associate when you, you hear the word open? So what is the first thing that you think about when you hear the word open? So when you're ready, type in the first thing that's, that's come into your mind when you hit the word open. Okay, I see available, scholarship, free, public, excellent. Anyone else want to share what they have as well? Okay, so now I want to do, what I want to do is flip this, right? And so rather than ask you what you think about when you hear the word open, what do you associate with the word closed? So when you're ready, type in the first thing that's popped into your head as it relates to what you think about when you hear the word closed. Walled off, private, right, <clears throat> okay. Anybody else want to share? No collaboration. Thanks, Sydney. Yeah, absolutely. And so really what you've put in the chat here resonates a lot with what I'm going to talk about today. The idea of openness is we're thinking about availability, transparency, collaboration. And what we're trying to really get you to think about is how research has, is trying to change from being a closed enterprise to being something that's much more open. So the focus of today is really to help you articulate the difference between closed and open research approaches, to be able to define what open scholarship is, to outline how open scholarship fits into the different stages of the research lifecycle, to help you identify some current open scholarship initiatives, and to apply best practices in open scholarship more broadly. And so when we think about open scholarship, there really are a lot of different ways to consider it and a lot of different ways that it's described. It might be open access. You also may have heard of the term open science, which is also very common in the sciences to describe openness in the research process. There's open source software. There's citizen science where the public actually collaborates and provides data and does research alongside researchers. And really what we're going to focus on and what's important for you to consider as you conduct research throughout your career as a student is the open research science side of things. This is really where we're going to focus our efforts today. So here we have an example of a very simple research life cycle where you have an idea, you develop methods to identify and answer those ideas, you collect data, you do some analysis on that data, of whatever that might be, and then you publish your results. And so at every stage, at the idea stage, you're asking a question, you're looking at existing research, and you're developing a hypothesis. At the method stage, you might be developing instruments, you might be planning an experiment, you might be identifying participants or, or resources that you want to study, and then you're collecting data about it. So you're gathering text or numbers or images, and you're storing that information, and maybe you're describing it. And then you're finally, you're, anal you're analyzing it, you're using software, you might be transforming it in some way. And finally, you're presenting it or you're publishing it in a journal, you're going to a conference, and maybe you're sharing your research with other people in some way. And so the goal with open scholarship is entirely to make all of these different stages and all the things we just described to be as transparent as possible. So what we're focusing on here is how do we bring all of the different elements of the research process into the light? And so let's take a look now at what we commonly see happen in the research process. And when we think about the research life cycle, closed research is really the way it has always been done, where the focus has been on the publication and that published article. Whereas the idea stage, the methods, the collection, while you might see some of it in that published article, ultimately remains hidden and, and unavailable for people who want to explore it further because all they're getting is that final article or that publication. 
And so if we think about research and the publication as the tip of an iceberg, all of the other information that made up that publication, all the hard work and the tools and the materials that we used to do our work is hidden below the surface. And so one of the challenges with this is if we don't know any of the information related to that publication and we can't really check or see or access any of that information, how do we know that it was done responsibly and ethically and, and in a way that allows us to have a better understanding of the research process? And so one of the challenges with this too is that the most common way to publish is through subscription publishing. So the problem with this is, let's say the university or the taxpayers or a grant funds a researcher or a student to do their work and to report on their results. Once that study is done, the faculty publish that in a journal. And what they end up doing is because those journals accept articles for free, basically what faculty or students are doing is giving away their copyright to publishers who then charge them later on for gaining access to that article. And so what's happening is through this model, we are not necessarily able to access a, a lot of the information or the publications that we have access to because these journals are creating very, very strong barriers to licenses in order to access them. So that even though we publish in them for free, we can't access the material or a lot of people can't access the material because they can't pay the, the cost to subscribe to a journal. And this goes for libraries as well. We struggle to pay for licenses every year to make sure that we can get some journals to access. And these prices continue to increase over time. And so when we think about closed research, what the subscription model does is only give access to those who can actually afford to pay for those articles even though it might have been funded by a public university or through taxpayer money. But really the bulk or the majority of people will not be able to access that information. And so when we think about that, not only can we not access any of the methods or the ideas or the collection that underlies that publication, but also it's restricting access to only a very small subset of people. And so really we're having kind of a double whammy here in terms of research really being closed off and inaccessible. And so why is this problematic? Why does this matter? Well, first of all, closed research hides key components of the research process. If we don't know how someone conducted their study, how can we trust their, that their publication is correct? It also considers other products of research less valuable. You might spend a lot of time developing a really great survey or, or creating a really interesting method that could be used by other people. But right now, because it's not seen as valuable, it doesn't get published and you don't get credit for it in the same way as you would a publication. It also makes reproducing or reusing research more difficult. So if you only have a publication, you don't have any of the data underlying that publication, and therefore you can't actually reuse any of the work for your own research. It restricts access. And one of the problems here is that because journals want people to publish in them, they only publish the most eye-catching high profile studies, which is known as publication bias. And so if they're only going to accept the most popular eye-catching or buzzworthy articles of the time, all this other great research ends up being rejected just because journals don't think that people will pay in order to access them. And ultimately, all of these things together eliminates our trust in research because if we can't access the research, we know that journals are, are, are prioritizing specific kinds of research, it creates a lot of distrust in the research community more broadly. And so why has this been happening for so long? Well, first of all, the incentives promote publication above all else. So if you want a grant or you want tenure or you want to get hired, people are looking at publications first in terms of your research record, because that's what has been the barometer for evaluating someone's quality overall. We also know that researchers have been pitted against each other competitively. So rather than working collaboratively, Researchers are basically competing to get as many publications as they can. Journals and publishers obviously make more money this way. And generally for authors and researchers, it's harder to do this. To make all of our research understandable to others and available takes more time. And I think that can be a barrier because we are asked to be publishing and working as hard as we can, which is a real challenge for people. And so let's think about how we can transition and how really the research community has been transitioning research 
to more of an open scholarship model. Before I move on, are there any questions that came up on the first part about closed research? I'll just take a sip of water while I wait. Feel free to, to unmute yourself or pose it in the chat. Okay, I see something. Okay, thank you. So really, how are we defining open scholarship and what does that mean? The goals of open scholarship are to make the products, so the publications, the data and the methods of publicly funded research, publicly accessible with no or minimal restriction. So that means not just that final publication, but all aspects of the research process that publicly funded should be freely available. The other goal is to foster sharing and collaboration as early as possible in the research process. And finally, to really create a system, systemic change to the way that research is done. So rather than this closed model, the idea here is we're going to open up everything as much as we can in order to allow others to use it, to increase collaboration and to move forward together. So open scholarship is really the idea that all of the things we discussed at every stage of the research life cycle is open and remain open so others can see the full scope and breadth of what our research entails. So rather than just have that publication at the top of the iceberg, we need all of the other elements that might come into play when we conduct research. Everything from our study protocol to the software we use, to the equipment that we might have looked at, to the archive where we found our research in the first place. Allowing this to come to the forefront allows us to get a much better picture of research overall. So what are the benefits of practicing open scholarship? First of all, it improves the quality, integrity, and transparency of research overall. It has been shown that because people see who practice open scholarship know that it has to be of high quality, they do better work because they know the public is going to see it. It also increases access for all of us to access other types of research. Rather than me creating and reinventing the wheel on a survey over and over again, I could maybe find one that's more accessible and available to me that someone else created already. And so it allows me to access different kinds of material freely. It also encourages collaboration. It creates an opportunity for your work to be reviewed at all stages. So rather than all of it happening at the end, by releasing your research earlier, you can actually get feedback from your community to say, oh, I haven't thought about this approach. Maybe I could work that into my work. And generally, it also establishes stronger engagement with the public. So if we're releasing our research openly and we're thinking about those who might be impacted by our research in the first place, we're engaging in a dialogue and a discussion more freely with them. Open scholarship essentially is meant to be a transparent process. So you're being communicating all the different steps that you take, you're getting peer review, and you're providing access at every stage. We also have the opportunity to change the way that we publish our articles by choosing an open access model. So just like in the, the subscription model, a funder or an institution might fund a researcher where you publish in an open access journal, it gets peer reviewed just as it would in a subscription journal. And if in some cases you might pay a fee in order to make your research open, but in many cases you don't have to. And once your article is published, it's free to anybody. So whether it's via you or via the publisher, it provides increased access to your final results. So when we think about open science or open scholarship, really what the published article do, does in open access is make it available to everyone. And we know that anyone who publishes in open access, their research gets cited more simply because people have more access and can actually work on um, doing research with these particular papers because they can access them for free. So let's look at what open scholarship looks like in action and what you can do specifically at every stage of the research life cycle to make your research more open. So first of all, let's look at some very common examples of what it looks like to practice open scholarship. So COVID-19 research is obviously one of the most obvious examples of open scholarship, where we had the development of vaccines in a very short period of time, simply because everyone dropped everything, made all of their research open and worked together and collaboratively to get that work done. 
Another example is the Montreal Neurological Institute. So a really great Canadian example of a place that decided they were tired of making their research closed. They were pursuing patents and grants in order to get money. And because of that, it was compromising their research. And so they said, forget it, we're tired of this. And as a result, what they've decided to do is they got everyone on board to agree that all their research results, all their data and all their outputs would be freely available. And since then, they've had huge collaborations. They've found outcomes in a much faster pace than they did before. And as a result, they're getting better research, which to them, they felt like was the most important reason why they were doing their jobs in the first place. So this institute is really one of the primary examples of practicing open at every single level and having buy-in across the board within their community. We also know that Canada has released a roadmap for open science. So what they're saying is that anyone who is federally funded must make their research publications, their data, and their materials openly available by January 2023. And so what the government is trying to do is say, if you're going to be publicly funded, you need to make sure that all your research is going to be open at all stages. So just to give you a sense of some initiatives and how open scholarship can work in practice. So where do we start? How do we start with this process? And how can you become an open scholar in your own work? At the beginning of the research process, so as you're starting on a project of some kind, you want to ask yourself the following questions. How can I share what I'm doing with others from the very beginning of the process? How can I hold myself accountable to what I say I'm going to do? Will others actually be able to understand what I'm doing or have done at every stage? Think about working in your own headspace at your own project and some of the things that you might do that may be understandable to you, but if you were to show it to someone else, they might say, whoa, that's crazy. I have no idea what you're doing. So in open scholarship, you want to be considerate of the other work that you might be doing and how it might be understood by others. And then finally, can I make this work accessible to everybody? So let's talk about how we do that. So what I'm going to do is at every phase of this project, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how you can make your research more open. So at the idea stage, the first thing that you can do is pre-register your project. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what pre-registration is and how it can be really beneficial to you to getting your idea and your research out there very, very early on. So pre-registration is really about releasing your research question and how you're going to conduct your study before you begin your project. What this does is it eliminates bias because it, it, you, it shows that you're holding yourself accountable for what it is that you're trying to do. It allows your research to be more reproducible because people can see what you're intending to do before you start. It allows others to be able to find that there's research being done on this topic. And it provides an opportunity for you to get feedback from other people at different stages of the research process. And really, this is where collaboration can start. So if someone's looking to start a project and they see that you've pre-registered an idea, you can create a larger uh, community to work with, which also may get you more resources in the long run. And so one of the ways and one of the tools that you can use to pre-register is something called OSF pre-registration. And what it does is it allows you to upload a, a description of your project online before you start. And there's a link here and I'll, I'm happy to share the slides with everyone um, so that you have access to the slide set as you go through. <clears throat> so once you pre-register your project, your idea is out there. People can see it, people can find it. And that's a great thing, is moving on to the methods. So as you start to identify tools that you're going to use to answer your research question, you can share those openly as well. And so let's take a look at what sharing those methods do. So really, it's, this is about how are you conducting your research? Again, it's going to eliminate bias because it's going to show people what you used to conduct your study. It also allows others to potentially reuse the work that you did. Again, it's another feedback opportunity. And it's a chance for you to get credit for the work that you've done. That's not just a publication, but all the hard work you put into your methods can be also given credit as well. So, some of the really great tools where you can upload your own methods, one of them is called protocols.io. And this is a tool that allows people to share 
different protocols or steps that they take in the research process. So here you can see an example of somebody who uploaded a protocol for re-entering labs post COVID-19 shutdown. And what it allowed people to do was basically see a protocol that they could reuse for their own institutions. So whether you're working in the humanities or the sciences or the social sciences, what this allows you to do is share the actual procedures of your research with others, but also find things that you could incorporate into your own projects. From there, we move on to the data collection phase. So this gives you a chance to describe your data so that it can be understood by other people. So one of the important things, and anyone who's here who is participating in the research data management program um, should have a good grasp of this in terms of making your data understandable to other people. By making your data more understandable, it's more easily understood, it can be reused by others, and it provides a more complete picture of your research project. So if you're working with specific data, you can also create a data management plan, which allows people to get a better sense of where your data is living, where it's being stored, how it's being managed. And this goes a long way to helping increase the transparency of your research process. I've included here a link to the DMP assistant tool, which is a way for you to create a data management plan for your research project, where it asks you specific questions about your data so that you can answer them at the beginning of your project to make sure that the, your data is usable for yourself and for others as well. Another example would be something like creating a data dictionary. So again, those who've taken the data management program are familiar with this, but if you're working with spreadsheet data, for example, simply having a dictionary that describes what's in that spreadsheet goes a long way to improving its understandability. So now we move on to the analysis process. And data analysis is something that's really important because it allows you to be transparent about how you're manipulating or how you are evaluating the data that you collected, whether that's something from an archive, like a text, for example, or videos or, or, or spreadsheet or field data. Analysis is a really important part that often goes missed in terms of reporting it in publications. And so, from the analysis phase, you wanna provide a description of how you're going to analyze or interpret your data after it's been collected. Again, this holds you accountable to say, how are you going to analyze your data? It also eliminates the risk of manipulation. So by you stating how you're gonna analyze your data it makes sure that people don't think that you're manipulating data in any way. It gives a user clear instructions of how you transformed your data. And it also presents an opportunity for you to share what software programs maybe you use or code or analysis techniques. Because again, these can be used by other people to think about how they could analyze their own data as well. So uh, this is a really great link about creating a data analysis plan. It's a resource about what to consider when choosing specific ways to analyze and, and what you should be thinking about when you're recording an analysis procedure. But ultimately you just wanna think about telling people a story about how you're transforming or analyzing your data in any way possible. So finally, what we end up with now is the publication phase. So we're at the sharing the publication, the data and any tools we might've created. When you share your research, you wanna be thinking again about sharing all aspects of your research. So the final paper, the documentation, the data when possible, your conference presentation, the goal here again is so that others can see the full breadth of your research. It makes your research reproducible and it makes it accessible to anybody. So one of the ways that you can do this is even before you submit a paper for peer review, for example, where you submit it to a journal where it's going to go through peer review, you can send a preliminary copy to a preprint server, which allows you to share your research or the first draft of your paper with everybody so you can get feedback, not only from a few select peer reviewers in a journal, but from your whole research community more broadly. Again, thinking about COVID-19 again, has really created a shift in how research is done. And so the preprint is really becoming common practice in terms of people releasing their research as soon as it's done so that others can see that it's being created and, and evaluate the results ahead of time to help inform research more quickly. 
This doesn't supplement the manuscript in a journal, for example, because it's not peer reviewed officially. But in my experience, sharing a preprint allows you to get feedback from your peers and your community of who you really care about and who you know is going to give you good advice on your paper. The other thing you can do, again, thinking about publishing, is choosing an open access journal. Again, open access journals give you more exposure because it's freely accessible. It allows practitioners to more easily apply your findings. You're going to get cited more frequently because people can access it. And ultimately, it's generally allowing your research to be more accessible broadly and available. Just as we described, when we think about that word open, this is really what we mean. If you're curious and aren't familiar with open access journals, there is a directory of open access journals through this link. And so you can see all of the journals that are available here. And notice also that there are 12,000 journals that are free to publish in. And so rather than you having to pay a fee to publish your journal, you can actually do it for free and make sure that it's freely accessible to others. And if we look at research more broadly, we can see here that this is an example and a graph of how open access is becoming more and more prevalent as research progresses over the years. And so we here what we see on this page is the variety of different types of open access journals that are available. And the gray bar is where closed research is being done. And you can see the dramatic shift in terms of how many articles are being viewed. We're looking at open access more broadly. And similarly, in terms of projections of publications, we're seeing a trend increase in terms of open access versus closed research in the coming years. So open access is really the future. And as we see journals start to, and the federal funding require journals to be open, we're, we should see a dramatic shift from that closed research model. Also, if you're interested in sharing data, so if you have a data set, whether it's a spreadsheet or it's qualitative data about um, that's private or sensitive in some way, um, you can share your data in what's called a repository. And so Canada has a federated research data repository, which allows you to share your data online with anyone and link it to your publication or link it to your other research outputs. Also important to think about, open scholarship sounds great in practice. However, depending on who you're, who you're working with on your project, or if you're working with sensitive information or with communities who may specifically have restrictions on having their data be open, you need to be considerate of that. And so um, indigenous populations, for example, whether you're working on their land or working with those people, um, have very specific guidelines of what can be open or not based on what the community approves. Similarly, if you're working with patients or with humans and you don't get their consent, you can't make all of your research open. So thinking about how to incorporate openness into your project and where that's possible is a very important step in this process. Another thing that you can use is a, there are many tools available that allow you to make all of your research open in one place. And so one of the best open scholarship tools, in my opinion, is the Open Science Framework. So here you can see an example of a project where that I've worked on in the past, and I have all of my data available online and all of my documentation about my project on the left-hand side. I have it organized by different information on the right-hand side. And you can see that I can also connect existing tools where I have information into this tool. So I have a Google Drive account logged in right here. I have a GitHub, which is for software available here as well. And so being able to put all this information in one place not only makes it open, but it also allows me to work collaboratively with others on my project. So I highly recommend using this tool. And so just to show you that I'm not someone who talks about open scholarship, but doesn't practice it. Here you can see an example of my own research and what I did to make sure that all of my research was going to be available online in one place. And so I did a study a year and a half ago where I pre-registered it at the very beginning of the project. As I was working through the project, I shared all of our research products online. You can see the little folder for my methods and for my raw data that's available here. And then before I published, I 
published a preprint that was available to put online. And then from there, <clears throat> I had that article published in CMAJ Open. So going over the whole life cycle, I took every step and all of this information is linked together. And so not only can someone look at my publication, but they can go back and see the preprint and the data and the pre-registration as well. Also remember by sharing this information, you can get credit. So even though it's not a publication, that information can be cited whenever you need to. So all of this information is not in vain. You will be able to get credit for your work as well. So I'm just gonna wrap up with a few um, last points, but I wanna see if there are any questions at this point based on what I've talked about so far. Okay. I have a couple if no one else has any. Sure. Um, do you find, or in your research, have you seen that making all of your research open to public, does it make more work or does it like make it a longer to complete these projects? <laughs> so that's a really great question. And I think upfront, obviously you're doing a little bit more work because you have, you're having to make things of a certain level of quality that allows you to, to feel confident in making them public. So just make it, it like nice and presentable. Exactly. And like understandable to others, which does take some time. I will say now that I do this all the time, it makes writing the final paper so much easier because I've documented all of the work ahead of time and it's all shared. And so actually writing it and structuring my manuscript or my paper is much easier to do because it's all been structured in my mind as I've made it shareable as I've gone through that process. And so the other thing that's been beneficial about doing that is I get feedback earlier and it makes my project better in the end. And so that has been a really great sort of outcome of making this work open. It's a great question. Yeah, so Janelle, that's a great question too. So journals do not publish uh, punish you for making your research open. At least they shouldn't. And so the only case where you might want to be careful is specific to preprints. So some journals, I would say most now accept a preprint as a way to share your research as it's being peer reviewed, especially now where the peer review process is taking up to a year or more for people because of the backlog. But otherwise, linking out to your methods or to your, your other information is, is perfectly acceptable and something I've done in journals all the time. So I can describe the methods in my paper as a, that I'm going to publish and just cite my open science framework project so people can investigate it more fully. And so generally, that's not a concern that I have seen. And really, it's part of the process. Your manuscript is the final piece, but you sharing along the way is just parts of that final product as a whole. But that's a great question. Other questions? Okay. I'll, I'll Janelle wrap has up. An, another follow up, really quick. She oh, sure. wants to know about um, using Open Scholarship for a thesis. Right. Yes. So, for that's an excellent question. So, yeah. So, for the preprint in this case, um, no, but absolutely. Like, I think in this case, because of your thesis, should be made public already. And it's, it's not, it's peer reviewed in a different way, obviously, by your committee. Um, all that other research can be open and you can share that as part of your thesis. And I know that the institution is moving towards being more open scholarship friendly and tools like Harvest, for example, which is our institutional repository for sharing your thesis and your dissertation is looking to be able to link out to those products more frequently. And many people share their data and their videos as well as they go through. So that I think in that case, making your research open is fine, but the thesis itself um, might not necessarily need a preprint because it's not going up for peer review. But let's say you want to turn your thesis into a paper later on, whatever you transform your thesis into could be a preprint. <clears throat> oh, interesting. So are there any issues with open scholarship intellectual property? So great question. Um, it's your own intellectual property. And so I would recommend you make open what you think um, is you're willing to share. But let's say you're working with a patent, for example, or you've received licensed information from someone, or you've paid for information from a company 
to do your research. In that case, there may be certain restrictions that would not allow you to share some of your work openly. But the benefit of releasing your work openly, if it's just your property, is it can be cited and credited. And so, for example, one of the studies I'm working on now, we built a, a valuation rubric for evaluating certain kinds of, of data sources. And that rubric got shared. We're not even, we haven't even written the publication yet, but we shared the rubric online and it's been cited and used by other people many times because they've implemented it in their own work. So not only am I going to get credit for the rubric I built, but when the publication comes out, I'll be able to link directly back to it. And so it's still my IP because they have to cite that work and give me credit for that work. And so that's why using tools like the Open Science Framework make sure that you receive credit for doing so. So really good questions. Okay, so wrap up. If we look at open scholarship, we've pre-registered our work, we've shared our methods, we've described our data so someone else would actually have an idea of what we're talking about. We've been transparent about sharing how we analyze our data and we've maybe shared a preprint, we've got our published articles up there, we've got our data shared. So important to remember, this is an ongoing process. To be transparent, you have to continually think about, would this have value to someone else? Should I make this open? Does it make sense? But what's also important is that open scholarship is not just about you doing this work. Think about the fact that if everyone is practicing open science, you're getting access to more ideas of research, to more methods, to more data, to more analysis plans and strategies, that you can use to better inform your work. And so this is a two-way street where if everyone is open, we increase collaboration, we increase access to research, and we increase our ability to do better work overall. And so what I want to leave you with as you think about this is, would you consider making parts or all of your research process open and publicly available, and why or why not? And so when you think about this, right, this is not a requirement or a mandate at this time, even though it's coming down the pike in terms of a way um, for people to make their research more open. This is really something that we're seeing more now in newer researchers who are coming up in the field who don't see why you would ever make your research closed. And in some cases, for example, people only are willing to share a preprint and they, they refuse now to share in a journal because they don't want anyone to make money off of their work. And that, that to them is like an extreme version of what it means to be truly open. So I'll leave you with this question to think about, but if you have any questions or there are some resources here available to you to think about open scholarship more broadly. And if you have any questions about open scholarship at any time, I have my email here, which you can feel free to contact me with if you have questions about this. And for that, I'll thank you for your time and I'm happy to chat and have other questions if people have them. So thanks. Thank you so much, Kevin, for joining us on the library today. And that was a really awesome presentation with a lot of really good info. Glad it could help be helpful. Yeah, it's it's meant to give people an idea of some resources that's available and hopefully an idea of what it really means to be open at all stages. Mm -hmm.